Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Apples and Genos Fantasy Hockey Podcast. My name is Nate Grutnablink, and I will be your host today. Blake and I are talking projections for the 2023-24 season for eight more teams, digging into how we think each of these situ- situations will play out. Now, these projections, at least mine, are going to go live on September 1st. That is this Friday if you're listening to this podcast as it comes out. So get pumped for that. You'll be able to see all of my individual player projections for everyone that I've done across the entire league. Obviously, in this podcast, we're going to delve a little deeper into how those projections came to be. Are you ready to get into this? Let's go. Now, of course, I do have your friend and my best friend, Blake Creamer, with me. Blake, how are we feeling tonight? Feeling fine. Looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, these are great episodes, and I love how much traction the first episode got, and that just gets me jacked up for this one, too, because these eight teams, to me, are a little bit more exciting. So um, I think we got a little bit more to talk about in this one. Absolutely. Yeah, last week's episode already the most listened to episode in Apples and Geno's podcast history. We'll try to bring the same heat. Last last week's was a bit of a beefer, Blake. Uh, I think we're going to do our best to keep it down, but we want to make sure that we're getting you the content you're looking for in this episode. Well, without further ado, let's hop into it. The first team on the docket is the Columbus Blue Jackets. They have a coaching change here. Mike Babcock coming back into the league. Now, Babcock has held down minutes for top players in the past. In Toronto specifically, I'm thinking about uh, like the Matthews and Marner. Uh, he did kind of keep them down below the 20 minutes level for the most part. And it was really after Babcock left that they started to get more minutes and really started to realize their top end potential. I'm not really positive that that's going to matter so much in in uh, Columbus, but I don't have anyone, um, any of the forwards anyway, I should say, over 20 minutes average time on ice. I I don't think it's going to be a major talking point uh, throughout the year that Babcock's really holding these guys back in terms of the ice time, uh, but it is worth noting at least that that's a potential risk that you may want to just have in the back of your mind when talking about these players. All right, the top two lines, we'll dive right into that. I think the top line is probably set in stone still. Boone Jenner, Johnny Gaudreau, Patrick Laine. Uh, But beyond that, it is going to be a little bit interesting. Obviously, the Blue Jackets, an up-and-coming team. I've got it right now, the second line set as an all-youth triumvirate of Adam Fantilli, Ken Johnson, and Kirill Marchenko. How do you feel, Blake, about the three that I've selected? Do you have anybody else there? What do you think about the top six in Columbus? I, I'm excited. I'm low-key excited for Columbus this year. I know we've I've, I've mentioned this before, but I was stoked on Columbus last year, and we all know what happened, right? Everybody just got annihilated, and then their season went to crap. So um, I think the top six is is looking pretty good. I, I obviously I love Boone Jenner, and but I really do think that he's going to maintain. Uh, you know, C1 for most of the season here with Fantilli in the wings. I mean, depending on how Fantilli plays, I could see, you know, maybe some some movement there. But for now, it's going to be big boon, Jenner, buddy. And also, you know, uh, talking about Babcock, uh, keeping the, the minutes down, I got boon, Jenner, for 20 minutes. He's a guy that can maybe get get stuck with, you know, just losing some, some deployment there, if that's the case. And I hope it's not because I think boon, Jenner is going to be Babcock's guy. And he's the captain. Absolutely. Yeah, I think Jenner's definitely going to be one of Babcock's guys. The second line there, the young guys, is going to be the most interesting. We're actually pretty consistent across the entire top six. Um, Like, for instance, you've got Boone Jenner for 60 points, I have him for 57. Johnny Goudreau and Patrick Laine, I have both for 80. You have Goudreau for 83, Laine for 79. We have Fantilli, Johnson, and Marchenko all in the 40s, uh, various spots. So I think we're pretty consistent, at least between the two of us, about how we feel like this is likely to play out. Uh, but 
it'll really matter who gets in on that power play. Let's talk about that power play. I think the Goudreau line A Jenner top line is probably going to be there. Jenner, like, if only to take face-offs, like, I think he's going to be there. Uh, and then, obviously, you have Zach Wierenski coming back from injury on the back end. That's going to be a huge boon to this power play, for sure. Even more of a boon than Boone Jenner himself, in my opinion. Oh my God, that's amazing. Did you like that? That was, yeah, that I was subtle. Like it. I loved it. All right. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I, I really think Wierenski is one of the more underrated defensemen. I think he's just been held back by injury. Um, and this is a year that I, both of us are predicting a 60 plus point season for him there with 20 plus on the power play. I really think he could elevate the rest of the guys in a best case scenario. And it's going to be a big deal for everyone in Columbus to have Zach Wierenski back. But the most important thing on the top power play is who's going to be that fourth member you know, Kirill Marchenko obviously went nuts scoring a ton of goals without getting any assists somehow at the end of last year. Kent Johnson is a player I know in your talk, Blake, with Corey Schneider, he highlighted Kent Johnson as a guy who could potentially take a big step. And then you have the new uh, Adam Fantilli, the new toy in town, who is really actually most people thought he was going to be the second pick and uh, fell to the Blue Jackets at number three. And they're ecstatic, of course, to have him fall to them there any of those three guys i could see there am i missing anybody blake who do you think could be the fourth forward on the top power play here um yeah i'm with you on those numbers i mean you can throw jack roslovic in there as well maybe i mean i but i mean he's the fourth guy i like marchenko there i think that makes sense but i don't know if they really want to give fantilli some some looks here and some offensive opportunity maybe they can slot him in somewhere like on the wing uh, that would be interesting. Um, him or Ken Johnson, I'd like to see. And yeah, to your point, exactly. I didn't, I wasn't thinking about Ken Johnson until I talked to Corey Snyder. And then I'm like, okay. Yeah. And then I started looking at this man's just, just some eye test stuff on Ken Johnson. That guy's a beauty. I mean, he's got a nice little highlight package there. So I, uh, you know, unfortunately he's not a, a great shot generator or chance generator at this point in his career, which is what we'd like to see. But I think it's going to be Marchenko's spot. I would say probably Johnson or, or, um, uh, Fantilli, you know, second up to that. Yeah. Yeah. The one thing, obviously, if someone was going to take a step, then, you know, in their second or third year is generally where that starts to happen. So it's definitely possible that Johnson uh, could take another step, either in terms of the shot chance generation or in terms of his share of that, or, you know, how many chances he's generating for other people, the on ice shooting percentage, all these things. Uh, if a player is going to progress to a higher level, the second, third years, you do start to see that in most cases. So I'm definitely not ruling that out, especially Especially if one of these guys gets on that top power play and kind of makes it theirs for the entire season. So that's definitely a spot I'm going to be watching very closely into the upcoming year. Right now in our projections, I think both of us have kind of just uh, straddled the line between yeah. a bunch of these guys. We don't have a major leaning one way or the other in terms of the time on ice. Uh, you have a little bit more to Marchenko than I do. I have a little bit more towards Fantilli, but... Um, Basically, I think we're kind of saying the same thing is we yep. want to see who's who it's going to be. And that's going to be somebody we're into for fantasy uh, defenseman here. We talked about Wierenski, big time upside from an offensive standpoint. After that, you know, Damon Severson, I guess, is the next guy that you're going to talk about. I have him projected for just 28 points. You're a little more optimistic at 35, uh, but definitely I don't like I'm not drafting Damon Severson. Are you drafting Damon Severson, Blake? No deep league. Maybe. I mean, what for why? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, I think he's, it's a good hockey trade in real life fantasy. It, it literally means nothing unless Wierenski goes down, right? Wierenski right. goes down. Then you're looking at Damon Severson. Like you pick him up off the waiver wire and you, and you love that sweet production. Cause he can do that. He can, he can be a power play guy. I mean, if they, if they did put him there, I mean, they still got Boakvist there who could potentially take that spot, but yeah. Um, on Wierenski too, though, he's still so uh, like, he's a value in drafts. I've done the, a couple mock mm -hmm. drafts here with good fantasy managers and he's still going around like 75. And, and I feel like that's too high or, or too low. Like he, he should yeah. be, he could be like, I don't know, maybe a, a whole round earlier than that, or maybe even more. Like you got a legit, uh, he, he can get 20 goals. He's a defenseman that can get 20 goals. And that's something that we should covet. You know, and there's not too many of them. So um, I, I still really like um, Zach Wierenski at value here. Absolutely. For a player that we had 
uh, fairly substantial difference in our projections mentioned we're pretty tight on the forward group here the one that we were the most different on was Adam Fantilli I did project Adam Fantilli I haven't projected a lot of the uh, probable rookies this year for the NHL. I just feel like I don't have good enough data in most cases to make that projection. Fantilli and uh, obviously Connor Bedard were a couple of the exceptions this year where I did feel um, at least reasonably confident in making some sort of projection, some sort of baseline projection. So I had Fantilli up for 21 goals and 50 points. You had him for 16 goals, 41 points. So nine points difference between our two projections there. Uh, again, I have them for a little more of the power play time and a little more even strength time, which is the majority of where that points difference comes in. I think most of our rates and everything uh, were pretty similar. Yeah, I have them less than a percentage point higher in shooting percentage. Like uh, most of it is just volume based about how much work we think you might get. Uh, I have them for 16 and a half minutes, kind of just playing into that third overall pick and yep. going to be a player that they want to trot out there and have the fans come out to see uh, there in Ohio. So that's, Honestly, I'm not too tied to that projection. I think we'll see in the early days with Fantilli and how it starts to come out if he really is that guy, if he is going to cement himself on that top power play and be all those things. Um, Fantilli, you know, maybe a, a last round flyer in most leagues, most standard sized leagues. I'm not aggressively uh, going after Adam Fantilli. I don't think there's a massive ceiling here unless that power play really does pop off and he is a fixture on it all year long. Yeah, I tend to agree. It's just, I, I'm like you, I, I pro, um, project rookies very safely like on the low end really and 41 for adam fantilli i think that that's probably low like this guy's got uh, offensive acumen um he's gonna slot right in the top six there's nothing saying that he's not gonna get the top line you know that that could that is could in the happen. range of outcomes right so i've heard people project adam fantilli for 60 which i think is a little bit that's a little bit rich for me obviously yeah. because i'm at 41 but i think 50 is reasonable too i think again we're probably bookending adam fantilli on the low end and the high end um, he's going to have a good season and he's going to have a great career, I think. And I think uh, being in Columbus is a nice place with Babcock, although he's a ding dong. I mean, I, I think it, it, he can get some sheltered minutes. He can develop properly with some decent players. And it, I think it's a good situation. Plus, he's got Ken Johnson on there, which uh, they're their buddies. And that's going to be his line. I like that second line, actually. Like, I like mm -hmm. what you call it, the triumvirate. <laughs> uh, the youth triumvirate. Uh, so I, I like that line. I'm interested to see what they do. For sure. Uh, just players that kind of stuck out in particular for me, it's line a, uh, being up there with an 80 point projection. I have them down for 31 goals. You have them for 37 goals and 79 points. So basically the same in total points. You just have them for more goals. Line a for me by the numbers. Anyway, the last few years has kind of transitioned into a bit more of a playmaker somehow. I'm not really sure why or how that's happened. Or if he's ever going to go back to being like this massive shooting percentage guy like he was in Winnipeg in his early years. In his early years, that's really what was driving it. Uh, I don't think his his um, rate stats have really changed all that much. It's really just been the conversion that's kind of tailed off the last three, four years. Mm -hmm. And so I'm left kind of wondering, is Line A just this, you know... 12% shooter is what I have him for. You have him at 13.3, which is pretty much the difference. Uh, yeah, is he really just this guy? But regardless, I think he is going to run into a bunch of points because I am projecting, you know, nothing's going to be as bad as it was last year. Obviously, line A hurt last year as well. Uh, but with Rensky back, with the young guys hopefully taking a bit of a step this year, I think line A for 80 points is actually a pretty solid bet. And I think you're going to get him at value in a lot of drafts this year. Big time, big time value again in those drafts that we did, those mock drafts. This this guy was going late. He was always available, and I skipped him a couple times too. I'm like, yeah. But to me, if you look at the situation that Line has had since he came to Columbus, like he had Torts Tortellini as his coach, uh, and and you know that didn't go well. I think Line is a sensitive guy, and he needs to kind of have his tires pumped a little bit. And he, he, you know, he had Tortorella for a little bit, which didn't go well. Like Line A made comments like a few years ago, like, oh, maybe I just, I don't remember how to play hockey anymore. Like saying things like that, right? Like he's, he's not confident in his shot. And then you look at the, just the players he's had around him. Well, last year was supposed to go well, right? Um, you know, he has John Gaudreau there and uh, uh, Boone Jenner. I mean, any chance you get to play with him, you're, you're loving life. But yeah, and then he gets injured, right? So he was on a 78 point pace last season. That's pretty darn good. This guy has 50 goals in him. He used to, and 
anyway. And I think mm -hmm. that that could potentially happen again. He's only 25, but yeah, he's got to stay healthy. And hopefully he's one of Babcock's boys, right? Because how he interacts with Babcock is really going to be telling on how his season goes. Like if we see in the first 10 games of the season, this guy's, you know, a healthy scratch in one game, like right the season off, this guy's done. You yeah. Know, he, he needs the confidence of the coach. Yeah. I don't disagree with that for sure. Let's talk about the next team. Number two on the list going in alphabetical order is the Dallas stars. Shout out to Binksy for his mm -hmm. team here. Obviously, they're not changing the coach after the season that was Peter DeBoer back in town. Top two lines, first line definitely not going to change. Uh, what a line that was last year for the Stars. Rupe Hintz, Jason Robertson, Joe Pavelski. Second line could get a little interesting uh, with Wyatt Johnson taking a step. I have him as the 2C here with Jamie Benn on one wing and then Matt Duchesne, the new acquisition, coming in on the right wing and that pushing, obviously, Tyler Sagan down to the third line. Is that how you see it playing out here, Blake? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you go out and you get someone like Matthew Shane. I, I think he should probably get in the top six there, right? Um, Daily Faceoff has Dadnov there and Duchesne on line three. I could very well see that happening as well. But, you know, getting Duchesne, I, I think, feels like a just get supplemental offense. Like if someone goes down, we mm -hmm. got Duchesne. We can pump him in, right? Does that mean he gets top six right away? I don't know. But I, th I think it's 50-50 uh, between him and Dadnov. Yeah, that's totally fair. Obviously, I don't think the top power play here is going to change. One of the best in the league last year. Jason Robertson, Rupa Hintz, Joe Pavelski, the top line there. And then Jamie Benn having a monster season last year, despite not having a whole ton of deployment. And then Miro Heiskanen on the back end, taking the huge step he did last year as well. I don't see anything changing here. These guys are going to have massive power play totals. Once again, I've got Rupe Hintz for 33 power play points, Robertson for 37, Pavelski for 27, Ben for 25, Heiskanen for 32. Like I've got these guys for big power play totals, and that bumps up their overalls. Um, I think really you can write this one in stone at this point. I don't see any reason why they'd go away from this. Yeah, lock it up. The, that's That power play was lethal, and why in the world would they change it? I mean, I don't know. Uh, Jamie Benn, and we'll talk about him in a little bit, but he's he's kind of the interesting piece to me. Like, I think he'll fall off at some point, and I think he obviously overachieved last year, but because of his role on that power play, his floor is solid. Like, he's looking at 20 power play points minimum. So, But we'll see. I mean, they've got a couple other pieces that maybe can go in there, but I don't know. If it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, I think that's really it for me uh, with Jamie Ben. is why would they change something that worked so well last year? The only reason could be obviously if the shooting percentage and all of that uh, comes down to such a point that he goes through a cold streak and, you know, they decide that they can get the same production out of somebody else. But until that happens, and, and I, honestly, the, the rest of the power play is so good that yeah. you could put a lot of different people in that role, and I think they do just fine. So I just don't see a reason to project it a different way. I did kind of, I didn't give them like an insane amount of power play minutes. I didn't put them over three minutes. I'm right at three minutes. You went for 2.75, um, so two minutes and 45 seconds of power play time on ice on average on the season. So I think, yeah, somewhere around... I have him at 57, you have him at 61. Like somewhere in there is probably where Jamie Benn's going to live uh, unless he comes off the power play one. And then obviously you dock him immediately for all those power play points we're talking about. So let's talk about Heiskanen. Really, Heiskanen is the only defenseman of note on Dallas, at least for fantasy purposes. You know, unless somebody really steps up this year elsewhere, I don't think we're going to be talking... Uh, much about any other Dallas defenseman on the podcast this year. You have him for 73 points. I have him for 70 points. Uh, yeah, I tend to believe that the breakout is real. Uh, he always kind of had this in him, but he did take a step as well last year, and that's what makes me uh, a little bit more confident in it happening. He could pull back slightly from the numbers that he posted last year and still be like one of the top defensemen across the league for fantasy. So I'm really quite I don't know if I'm bullish, but I'm probably like at market, I guess I would say on Miro Heiskanen for this year. How are you feeling, Blake? Yeah, I think he is who we think we think he is, right? I mean, he showed that that guy's a horse. He plays a ton of minutes. I mean, I've got him for 25 and a half minutes. I think I, I you know, bumped him down just a bit, uh, almost on all metrics, just to, 
Cause I think, you know, we can be like, Oh, you know, he was redlining, but like, it still came out. My projection is 73 points. <laughs> so, I mean, this guy is, he's good to go and he's on that power play and he's just clearly, you know, the number one defenseman and, you know, one of the top, uh, one of the top five, top six D men should be going off your draft board. Really? Um, one defenseman I, I do, I'm interested. I'm not going to be drafting them, but I'm interested in Thomas Harley and I'm interested in Nils Lundqvist. Um, mm -hmm. Lundqvist is going to get power play two most likely. And, you know, he was a rookie last year, not a big season. Like what did, what did he get last year? 16 points in 60 games. That show ain't no good, but uh, you know, he's a young guy. He's 23. I'm just, I'm just interested. And then obviously Harley had a nice playoffs last season, but he wasn't getting power play time. He was just converting at even strength. So two guys I'm interested in, but yeah, Heiskanen's running show there. No question. Absolutely. Let's talk about the player with the biggest difference in our projections. That's Matt Duchesne. You have him down for 55 points. I have him down for 47 points. Talk to me a little bit about Duchesne, about the role you see here, and why you think he could get to 55 um, yeah, let's see. So I'm just trying to look at my projection here. So yeah, I had him just over two minutes on power play time. So that says to me, it's going to be power play two with moonlighting on power play one. Um, I've got him for like 14 power play points. What did you have him for? I just got yours here. I also had him for 10. So a few okay. points there. Yeah. A few points on the power play, just converting a little bit more at like playing with better players, basically. Um, you know, if he's in that top six, like, you know, Wyatt Johnson, Jamie Ben, eh, is it a better player? Probably than what he had last year in Nashville. Right. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, just, just a little bump at even strength. I mean, he's, he can still do stuff, right? Matt Duchesne, um, you know, came off a, a career year there in Nashville in 2021. And then, you know, predictably fell off to 56 points and 71 games last season. So I think that's closer to the player he's going to be, but you know, with better, um, with better players that he's playing with. So not a huge take on Duchesne, but just just that that team is very good. And I think he, he'll get a little bit of time on the power play as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that would be the case for Duchesne to kind of outperform. He sticks on the second line. The second line performs. Another point that would be in Duchesne's favor is if Wyatt Johnston is a part of that second line and Wyatt Johnston is a breakout star, which is something I am holding out hope for <laughs> this year. I really liked what I saw from Johnston in the underlying numbers last year. At even strength this year, I have him projected for 7.75 shots per 60, but 9.25 individual scoring chances for per 60, leading to a 14% shooting percentage at even strength. Those are really good numbers, and those are numbers that I actually feel pretty good about projecting him for. Just the ratio, I've talked about this before, but the ratio of scoring chances to shots on goal, it seems like he's a bit more selective with his shots, but he is able to convert on those shots because they're really good chances and obviously he finishes a good number of those chances as well but even still like the base rate there of 7.75 at even strength is a really good base rate if he gets elevated on the power play i'd be very very interested in the ceiling case for wyatt johnson as it is i've got him for 47 points i think he's one of the more interesting players on this team for the upcoming season uh, you also have him right at 48 points, so we're really close on Johnson here. What do you think? Do you think he's got what it takes to take that next step and be a star for fantasy? I swear to God, part of my projection is like, Nate really likes this guy. I got to dig into this guy and see what the hell's going <laughs> on, right? Um, so yeah, I, I like him too. I just like Dallas as a team. And if he's the second line center, second power play, um, I, I just like his opportunity there, much like Duchesne, right? I, and you bring in Duchesne, I think that's an upgrade over to you know what he was dealing with uh, last season, right? This is a more offensive player. So there's a few more points to go around. But you know, that said, you know, I have him for 47 or whatever, but I could just as easily see him falling off, right? This is a this mm. is a it'll be a second year player. He's young, he's only 20. Like it, it's this is a hard league. You come in full of piss and vinegar and you rip 24 goals in 82 games. Like, you know, we could see kind of like a, you know, a most sider situation. I know it's a defenseman, but kind of just someone who falls off a little bit in their second year due to expectations and the expected success that they're going to have in the second year. And maybe it just doesn't come to fruition. Right. And they have some other players that that could maybe step up there. I mean, you still got Tyler Sagan, right. Um, mm -hmm. Who can, who can do some stuff. He's, he's cooking on the third line. So yeah, I, I like the player, but, you know, it's, it's a little, little flimsy to me. It's, it's kind of wishful thinking, I think for me, for Johnston, but I, I like it. And you know, if it happens, we're going to be doing a little dance, aren't we, Nate? 
Well, I am. You just said my take was wishful thinking. So hey, I, I, I projected him for more than you. So what the hell? <laughs> yeah, no, that's my take. All right. You're, yeah. <laughs> all right. Let's keep going. Let's talk about the Detroit Red Wings here. Derek Lalonde back in town once again, unfortunately, in my estimation. But that's a topic for another day. Top lines here. I think you've got Dylan Larkin, Lucas Raymond, Alex Debrinkit as the top line. And then really, it's another situation where I'm talking about a middle six. Right now, I've got Comfer, Bergeron, Perron as the second line. And then the third line is Cop, Fabry, Sprong. You could convince me that they're going to go a lot of different ways. Yep. They've blended the back end of these lines a fair bit uh, under Lalonde. So that's definitely in the cards as well. If things aren't working, they'll just keep churning until they find something they like. So uh, who do you think will end up getting the most minutes here? Do you like the trio that I've set up as a second line? Uh, yeah, you know what? Um, Jonathan Bergeron is a player that I'm not super familiar with. So, you know, I've got him on the second line too, and I've watched a little bit of his play just to kind of try and get a feel of the guy. But yeah, that's, that's one I'm not super stoked on or just cause I don't know enough about the player, but who's coming for his minutes. I don't, I, I think he's probably pretty good on that second line there. Um, yeah. And then Perron, I think is good. Although I'd love to see my man, Daniel Sprong on the second line. I put him up in the first line, put the Brinkett on the second line. All right. Spread out the scoring. <laughs> um, yeah. Daniel Sprong. I like that player a lot. Um, he's, that's a nice pickup for Detroit as well. Low risk. It's the Iser plan. All right. They, they got, they got something cooking over there, but, um, yeah, that's how I see the, the top two lines kind of shaking out as well. Yep. So let's talk about the top power play unit. I think quite honestly, at this point, I'd feel pretty confident in saying, you know, Larkin to bring it absolute fixtures. Raymond, do you think is going to be there? He, arguably been his most effective point he obviously took a step back last year after a pretty strong rookie year but i think his most effective play is on the power play so i don't see why they'd take him away from the one thing that he's doing the best for them david Perron has historically been a terrific power play player i do think Perron, uh, as he continues to age is probably moving out of that that uh limelight of his career i guess you would say and i do think that he and the brinket might uh, kind of war for the same kind of um, shooter spot on that power play. So that'll be a little bit interesting to see how that works out. I think they'll try to figure it out with the top four guys there, the top four forwards that uh, have, you know, historically been the most power play, uh, most effective on the power play that they have in the fold now. And then on the back end, I do have Shane Gossespierre as the power play one defenseman. We've been talking about this actually over the past week in the Apples and Genos Discord server, which you should go into the description of this episode right now and click the link and join. And you can get in on these kind of discussions as well. I just don't see why Detroit would have gone out and paid $4 million. I know it's a one-year contract, but why are you paying $4 million to a power play specialist if you're not going to use him as a power play specialist? That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. More at Cider. Um, we'll get into Cider a little bit, but I, I just don't think Cider is just a locked and loaded power play one defenseman in the National Hockey League. And so it makes it pretty easy for me to see Shane Gossespierre kind of taking over that role and just kind of holding it down for the season because he legitimately has been one of the better power play specialists across the league for a number of years now. How do you see the top power play here, Blake? Am I off base or am I in the right vein here? No, this is a, this is a great conversation and it's just something that I love about fantasy in general, right? Like who's going to get it. And this is a legitimate conversation because, um, neither is a lock in my opinion, like cider is not a lock. I, um, I thought that I had Gosses bear as number uh, on the top power play, but it looks like I put cider on the top power play. And I'm trying to think what my thought process was there. Like, um, I, I think because of who he is to the team. I think he's going to get that first shot. He got the first shot last season with Hronik there, and then they moved him off and put Hronik. Um, so I, but this all said, like, I absolutely agree with what you said. When you bring in a power play specialist, like why, why would you have him toil away on power play too? It doesn't make any sense. Um, all that said, like I have cider on the top power play, but I've got cost to spare for more points. Um, I've got him for, uh, you know, 17 power play points and cider for 15. So, you mm -hmm. know, it, it all just depends. And, and then interesting times too, for cider, I've, I've got him at uh, two minutes and 45 seconds uh, on the power plate. Then I've got, uh, you know, just over two minutes for Goss's bear. So they're kind of eating into each other's value there, but you said something really smart in the discord. Um, it was just like at, at ciders ADP, 
Why would you want to take a value on someone that may or may not get power play one? And if they do get power play one, that's not even something that they're really good at. You know what I mean? Like it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. Cider's a guy I'm going to be fading for sure. Unless I'm in cat's leagues. I'd rather have Goss Bear, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a spot where I'm content to be wrong on cider. Obviously. Yeah. Bangers cats. You're talking a different story. Cider. Absolutely elite in bangers cats for those hits and blocks. You're definitely going to want to be in for that. But in normal settings, like I don't think you're winning big. It's kind of like a win small, lose big play with yeah. Cider in my mind is even if you win and he is on power play one all season, I don't know that you're getting a player that's like, I think his ceiling is probably 55 points unless he takes a huge step here in year three. It's possible, but I also don't think we've ever seen anything from Moritz Cider that's been elite. Like, you look at his numbers, compare them to any power play defenseman across the league for the last couple of years. Like, they're not remarkable. Like, this is not a player that's just dominating on the power play. It's not a player that's dominating at even strength. Like, his even strength IPP is 35%. A lot of these top defensemen that you'll hear us talking about as we go through all these teams, these guys are 42%, 45%. The best ones are up at, like, 48%, 50%. So this is not a guy who like factors into a huge share of his team's offense. It's not a guy who appears to drive a huge uh, amount of his team's offense. Again, terrific player. Absolutely love the player. I love watching the player, but I just don't see the bowl case for Cider that it seems like the fantasy community is presenting vis-a-vis -vis his ADP right now. And so for that reason, I think I'm just going to be out on the player pretty much entirely. And I'll lean into the variance there with Gossis Bear and I'll kind of plant my flag there and say I think Gossis Bear is that guy. He's a guy who's shown to be very effective on the power play can actually drive play on the power play can actually improve a power play from the back end which is not a spot that a lot of a lot of uh different defensemen can say and so i think i'll just lean into that like i have gossip bear right now for 46 points 19 points on the power play i have marut cider for 37 points um and oh, i God. have yeah i have gossip bear for three minutes on the power play i have uh, cider for two minutes and 15 seconds on the power play but obviously with the second unit for most of the season is how i see that playing out so yeah it's a it's a i guess a bearish uh, projection on cider but again it's a spot where i'm just willing to be wrong because i think even if i am wrong and cider's on that top power play all year long i just don't think i'm losing that much by having him there he just doesn't convert either i mean you know it's I like, I, I remember that conversation I had with Corey Schneider as well. And he was talking about young players that kind of, they, that are, that can continue this production and play driving. Like they kind of come in with that skill, right? It's just, they need minutes to do that. Cider's never really had that skill. So it's not like he's coming in with that. So I think he's going to turn out to be more like a defensive stalwart, you know, kind of a guy like he's a lead at that. Like, you know, uh, stopping zone entries and stuff like that, hitting. This guy's a beast. But, yeah, um, they actually came out the same for me. I think I had them both for uh, 42, 42.8 points. All right, so there you go. There you what, go. what did Cider ever do to you? <laughs> Nothing, but, uh, yeah, just following the way that I'm reading the situation and the numbers here, and that's where I came to. We got to move on. We got to talk about Daniel Sprong, Blake. We got to talk about your boy. You have him for 47 points. I have him for 35. Was the biggest difference between the two of us. I think a lot of this is you projecting that Sprong is going to score 27 goals. I have him for 21. Hell Just yes. Being a lot more efficient, really, than, than I have him being. And then... Yeah, you had him for a little more uh, power play time, so a little bit more of that uh, that juicy time on the power play to prop up those numbers. Uh, but talk to me about the bull case for Sprong since he's one of your boys now. Yeah, I call him the slinky. Yep, Daniel Sprong, the slinky. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm excited about this player. You know, I, I just trust the metrics. I love what he was able to do last season. I mean, we all, you know, witnessed, or did we witness? Did anyone watch any Seattle Kraken games? Um, I don't know, but this man got 46 <laughs> points in 66 games in 11 minutes and 25 seconds, average time on ice. Damn. All right. So he's going to get more than 1125 in Detroit. It has to happen. Right. So, um, you know, I'm not just taking the metrics from Seattle and putting them over into Detroit. No, but I mean, his play driving is insane too. his IPP. I think I, I knocked some off of it still. Like he's going to a new team, right? It's different players, but it's still like, 
he's involved in the play when he's on the ice, he's involved in the play. And, um, you know, he, he had a very efficient season last year, but, um, I just, th this is a, this is a bullish projection on Daniel Sprong. No question. Right. But I'm a positive guy. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I think that he he's underrated. This is like a last round flyer guy to me. If, if he's there or just a watch list and, you know, you got an injured player, put him in the IR, go pick up Daniel Sprong and, and you're going to like the way you feel. I guarantee it. All right. But um, yeah, just just someone I'm keeping an eye on. I think he's good for 20 goals at least. Um, and I think he's going to get more ice time. So more ice time, similar metrics. That's where I'm getting my numbers. Yep. Yeah, it makes sense. I was just going through the numbers comparing how you and I have them worked out. We actually both have them for the same average time on ice. You have them being uh, just more effective, basically driving more play, more shots for when he's on the ice. And then the on ice shooting percentage, you have 1.3% higher, which is a fairly substantial difference between our two projections in the end. I think I would say definitely I would be pretty into Daniel Sprong if he gets into the top six consistently or if he gets on the power play one. I'm definitely more interested in talking Sprong at that point. It's just that it seems like wherever he's gone, he's never gotten that deployment. And I wonder if he's just another one of these guys with the great underlying metrics who never gets that opportunity up the lineup. And so I'm just not going to project like he gets exposure to great players. I'm going to project like he's playing down the lineup and he's just trying to drag along some bottom bottom six teammates basically uh with his yeah his really legitimate shot and chance generation numbers uh, i also have him a little bit less efficient of a shooter i have him for 10.8 percent you have him for 12.3 percent uh so yeah just leaning down on the shooting percentage there and that's kind of where we came out to on the difference for sprong but definitely like i said definitely a player with great underlying metrics and one that if he did get up the lineup if he did end up you know if he ends up on the larkin line like larkin line and power play one daniel sprong signed me up i'm all about that but uh, i i just don't see that as a likely outcome for sprong at this point and so as a base projection i i'm kind of keeping them down here for now all right, we talked about Sprong, we talked about Cider. Those were the two guys we really wanted to hit on with this team because I think they're the most interesting. Uh, Larkin, we have you have 80 points, I have him for 83 and a half. I have Debrinket for 80 points, you have him for 84. Like um, we're pretty in line with the top end stuff. I think there's not much to go around there. And I think we can call it quits on Detroit and move on to the Edmonton Oilers. I don't know why we would want to talk about these guys for fantasy purposes. Wagon. Uh, absolute wagon, especially that power play unit. Let's talk about the coach, though. Jay Woodcroft back in town once again. So we don't expect any changes to how things are run or the efficiency of this team, which is great. That's what we want to see when a team went as well for fantasy purposes as it basically possibly could have that helps when you have Connor McDavid uh, on your top line right now. I've got it. McDavid, uh, Kane, Brown, Dreisaitl, Hyman, uh, all there in the top end. I think, yeah, obviously uh, Nuge is going to be up there too. Really. That's the top six though. Uh, I think Connor Brown is going to be that sixth member. Do you see anybody else getting into the top six? No, I think it's it's going to be a mishmash there. Um, yeah, Brown's going to be interesting, but yeah, I, I've got him top top line there with McDavid, and I got Hyman on the left wing, and then Kane on the second line there with Dry and uh, Nuge. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, power play one, I think they're going to run it back. I don't see any reason why you would change after a pretty much a historic power play last season. McDavid, Drysaddle, Ryan Nugent, Hopkins, Zach Hyman, and Evan Bouchard would comprise that unit. Let's talk about Bouchard as we get into the defenseman from this team. Bouchard, I think, is going to be a key player in a lot of drafts. I think he might get overdrafted in some rooms where people are like, oh, yeah, this guy's going to go for 80-plus points this year because he's on Edmonton and that's all they know. I think there's also probably some rooms where he's going to get underdrafted just because he hasn't had a full season of being that top power play guy. Uh, so I think he's going to be a guy that you see bounce around in a lot of rooms and you're never going to actually know where he is going gonna go so it really kind of it's really kind of imperative that you know where you want to draft Evan Bouchard and you know what value you're comfortable with between us we're actually uh pretty far apart this is actually the player we're the most apart on you have him for 68 points I have him for 58 points so 10 points difference between the two a good chunk of that on the power play you have him for 28 power play points I have him for 22 power play points 
So let's talk about Bouchard. I don't think either of us have any question. It's his power play. We're not thinking that Nurse or Ekholm or any of these guys are going to touch him from this point out. I will say Bouchard's like... His advanced metrics are all very good. Uh, I have no qualms about him from that perspective. But also, I don't think that Edmonton really relies on their defensemen on the power play to run a lot of the power play through their defensemen. Like a lot of it is just like give it to McDavid and let him find a way to pass it to Dreisaitl and they score. So that's a little bit of it for me. I have him projected for a 48% IPP on the power play. So that's like, obviously about half of a historic power play is still pretty good, but it's not as good as, you know, some guys across the league who get 70% of whatever their team's doing on the power play. So that's a bit of the reason why he's held down a bit in my projections. Talk to me about Bouchard. Talk to me about the 68 points you have him down for here. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm interested in having this conversation because I thought my projection was a little bit conservative. And uh, yeah, so 58 that, you know, listening to what, what you're saying, though, like that doesn't seem egregious to me. I could I could very well see a 58 point Evan Bouchard and have that be a successful season, like 58 points in 82 games. That's a great season, you know, but I think there's more there, like 22 points on the power play. I think I don't know. We, we can't just discount what this man did in the playoffs. Like, you know, it wasn't just like they don't run it through D. Like, this guy led the the playoffs in power play points. I know that's the outlier, right? That's not something I'm relying on. But you've got it. I have it in the back of my mind. It's like it, he's not just out there, like, you know, passing the puck around, give it to McDavid. Like, he's doing stuff. Um, you know, he, he's having little conversations with McDavid. Like, okay, I'll fake the shot. I'll kick it over to you. Boom. You nail it. Like, he's he's entrenched there. And he, and he really showed out in the playoffs. Redlined, obviously. That's not something we can expect. But... Um, I do think 28 points, even on the power play on this power play is, is, is a little conservative. I think he has the ceiling for more. I think people would argue that, um, you know, I'd rather be on the low end of Bouchard this season than, than the higher end. Um, just because he, like you said, we haven't seen him do it for 82 games. So uh, a season's a long time. 82 games is a long time. It's not, you know, this, whatever, how many played uh, games he played at the end of the season and then at the start, right? Like he's got to run it for the whole season with no issues, like no Darnell Nurse coming up or a trade or, you know, Matias Ekholm even taking some time. Like, I, I don't know, you know, so um, I like, or, or another thing I looked at too, is I looked at Tyson Berry, like just in terms of uh, Bouchard's IPP on the power play. I had it for 54 or 52. I can't remember what I put, but um which is a little higher than what you have. But Tyson Berry had like a 56% um, IPP on that power play, and he played most of the season on it, right? So he's getting his touches there on the power play. Um, and I, I moved Bouchard down just a couple percentage points, and it still kind of came out at 67 points or 68 points or whatever. So I, I feel good about this projection, I think. But like you said, too, he's all over the place in drafts. Like if you got an Edmonton Oilers fan in your draft, boom, they'll take this guy in the second round. They don't even care. <laughs> it's like, do not take Evan Bouchard in the second round. You probably shouldn't take him in the third round either, um, in my opinion. But, you know, uh, people are going to be, uh, you know, on this man's jock all season because he's uh, he's quarterbacking the best power play in the league. One of the best power plays I've ever seen in my life. So, yeah, I don't know. It's it's interesting. If, if I can get him at value, which I kind of find end of the third round, early fourth round, then I'm, then I'm in on Bouchard because he does other things too. You know, he's got some decent periphs. He had 95 hits, 77 blocks last season. Pretty good, you know, and that was in 18 minutes, 30 seconds ice time. He's going to blast that. You know, he's going to get, um, you know, 21, 22 minutes. Like, I, I don't know what I have him for here, but um, yeah, he's going to have a ton more ice time. What do I have? Yeah, just under 22, 22. minutes. Yeah. So there you go. Um, it, I'm excited about the player. I think we're both kind of being conservative and I could see it going both ways too. Yeah, the one thing I will say that I should have mentioned before is I would draft Bouchard higher than his projection here because that ceiling is there. Like, if the power play does run through him a little bit more, if he does get more, like Darnell Nurse, I have projected for 19 and a half even strength minutes, and I have Evan Bouchard for 17 minutes and 15 seconds average time on ice at even strength. If Bouchard gets an extra two minutes and just matches Nurse like they're the top pair and they go together uh, every single shift all year long like if all of a sudden he gets an extra two minutes like you're talking about a huge bump just from even strength and then if the power play goes off like Bouchard is that defenseman who does have that point per game upside in his range of outcomes and there are not many defensemen who have that so I would draft Evan Bouchard as if he were 
uh, projected for more, right? Like uh, a lot of people, I think they'll look at a base projection and they'll be like, all right, uh, he's definitely not as good as this guy who has a two points higher base projection. But you got to think about range of outcomes with all these players. You got to think about, you know, what's the effect of if Evan Bouchard does not have a great season, uh, that's probably like a... 50 point season right uh, worst case maybe he gets bumped off but i don't really see that as yeah, a huge threat yeah. exactly so but the the bull case is kind of everything that we've laid out here is there's a lot of ways in which this could break right for bouchard and he absolutely destroys this projection and has just a monster season and so those are the kind of players that you want to slightly overdraft at least relative to their projection right the people that have the ceiling that could be like a league winning level of ceiling and so for that reason i'm not gonna fault people for drafting him as if he were projected for more in fact i'm probably going to be doing it myself uh the last thing that i do want to talk about with edmonton is the rnh drop off that i foresee coming actually both of us foresee coming i just glanced at your projection i have them for 80 points you have them for 79 points obviously eclipsed 100 last year with just a monstrous uh, power play basically is what yep. it boiled down to i think he's going to get less of that power play um percentage basically the ipp is going to come down on the power play it's going to be a big part of it i do have the power play just dropping back slightly from last year it's hard to predict them to be historic two years in a row i mean if any power play could do it it'd be this one but uh, it's hard to project that right as a base projection so i do have nuge coming back you have them basically right in line like we're two points apart here uh, two points apart on the power play i think we're seeing this pretty much the exact same way here blake yeah, absolutely. Um, but this guy's interesting. I think a lot of people are, are being smart about it, right? Like, um, I, I haven't seen him drafted real high. Actually, what am I talking about? Um, one of the, one of the, the cats league mock, um, someone drafted him in the third round. I was like, huh? Yeah, that's rich for me. Whoa, what are you doing? I mean, you know, obviously power play, if, if it goes historic again, sure. Like he had 53 power play points, buddy. That's amazing. But, um, I see a big regression coming a 25% regression, basically. So that said, I picked him up today or, or was close to picking up today in the points league mock at, at like crazy value. You know, he's still like, I value him as like a 70 to 80 point player with awesome power play numbers. Like that's very valuable, especially in a points league, but it's all dependent where you draft this man. Right. And he's going to, he's going to be all over the place because yeah, you got guys that are chasing performances like, Oh, hundred, he's hundred point Nuge now. Like, no, that that's his, his, on a shooting percentage, historic, ridiculous, highest ever. Um, power play points, 53. That's not going to happen again. I mean, I have them for 34 power play points, which is amazing. Um, and you probably have them for something similar. I don't know what you have them for, but. I'm for yeah. 36 power play 36. points. Yeah, yeah, that's great. But that's 20 points less than what yeah. he got last season. All right. That's your regression right there. And, and that's just if everything holds at even strength. Right. So it's a great season for Nuge. Um, and I do think he's kind of broken through a little bit. He's found his role in this team. But yeah, it's it's all dependent where you're going to draft this guy. For sure. Uh, I actually misspoke. There was one other player just want to mention because I know we're going to be hearing about him. A lot of people are going to want to know where we have him projected. Connor Brown, you have him for 48 points. I have him for 46 points. Do think that he fits into this top six, gets a fair amount of minutes. Yeah, we're pretty tight on this one here as well. Do think that he ends up getting reacclimated uh, with McDavid. You have, again, we talked about the uh, Drew N. McKinnon Jr. narrative, the Erie yeah. Otters narrative here with Connor Brown and Connor McDavid. I just think it actually kind of fits a little better here in Edmonton than it might in Colorado. So I do think that uh, Brown may actually end up playing with McDavid a fair bit. And any exposure to McDavid is going to result in a decent season. He's probably a streamer level player, but at least a player that you're going to be talking about for fantasy purposes throughout the season. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm still not... I don't like this projection. I, I projected him for 46 <laughs> or 47, but it didn't feel good about it. Like, like you said, he's streamer level just because it, it's, he only got that high because he's on the top line in Edmonton. And if he gets that right, but if he doesn't get that, get the hell out of my sight. All right. This yeah. guy reminds me of JT Comfer on the Detroit Red Wings, right? That's like, like what, you know, the, the metrics are terrible. Like he's a defensive player. This is a guy who's going to be out in the last minutes of games, you know, um, just just fighting for loose pucks, battling. He's a like a great team guy, great defensive guy, but it's his game is not offense. Like his best ever season is forty three points in Ottawa with just over twenty minutes time on ice. I don't think he's getting that. 
So, yeah, it's just a player I'm not too in on. I'm, I'm probably going to be leaving him on the wire. For sure. All right, Blake, we're halfway through. At this point, I, we are going to take a break, and I want to do something a little different. Anyone who's listening or watching at this point is obviously into what we're doing here, and so I hope there's someone who matches what I'm going to talk about here. Um, just kind of putting the call out once again for someone to join the podcasting team, and really this came about, I kind of had a self-realization moment. I do tweet about the kind of quote-unquote old white man syndrome of the NHL a fair bit and how um, a lot of their decisions just don't make good business sense and it's just yeah a lot of old white guys doing what old white guys do uh, and I rail against this online on the Twitter account a fair bit and so <laughs> I also had this realization that the podcasting group here the people that you see on the screen if you're watching on YouTube it's a lot of guys who look and sound the same we're all you know guys in our 30s 40s uh, white guys talking about fantasy hockey so with that in mind I am actively looking to add someone to the group who is different you know that can look a lot of different ways you could be um, female non-binary lgbtqia plus um, bipoc like anything that's a little bit different from us and really i want to emphasize that this isn't just something uh it's not just lip service it's not something to you know make me feel good about the brand uh, i've as you may have heard me discuss on a couple of episodes here or there i have completed my master's in in business administration, my MBA. I had several readings and assignments. It really opened my eyes to the value of intentionally incorporating the opinions and work of people whose life experiences are different than the majority. Um, there, like, there's statistical studies that have been done on this. Like, it's been proven basically that this is a benefit. There's a statistically measurable benefit to open yourself up to the opinions and work of people who have different life experiences than you do. So, if that's you, if you identify in that way and you're into, you know, the stats and the fantasy, the way we are here at Apples and Genos, please do reach out. You know, even if you're unsure about, you know, podcasting, getting in front of a uh, camera, getting in front of a microphone if you haven't done it before let's just talk you know worst case scenario it's not a fit and uh, we just have a good talk and we go our separate ways i'd love to you know just meet members of the community too that would be um, a win in my books as well so there are other ways to be part of the team even if uh, podcasting or doing that is not a not a fit so please uh, if that's you if you know you're hearing this and you're like yeah that could be me i could see that i'd, I'd like to reach out and i'd like to be a part of this in some way then please do reach out um, um, it's something that I uh, have been, you know, slowly uh, growing to feel more passionate about. And so I told that to the podcasting team here last week and they're all about it. So I'm really excited about this. And I really do hope that we find someone or, you know, maybe several someones who uh, kind of fit the bill there and we can all uh, form a team together and really, yeah, kind of help take apples and genos to the next level and i think that's really a way that that can happen so if that's you please do reach out you know there are many ways to do that if you're in the discord you can dm me uh, you'll find me in there you can find me on twitter at apples genos lots of ways to do it if that's you all right blake are you ready we got to get back into this it's going to be a beefer but we got to talk about the yeah. florida panthers Let's do it. Sounds like you're trying to replace me, Nate. So that's, that's <laughs> you know what? You know, sounds like a, sounds like a positive thing. Yeah. I thought we were best friends, and then you know you talked some uh, some snide about uh, my guy Wyatt Johnson for a second some, there, yeah. and so you know just some yang every, on your table. No problem. Yep. No problem. Everything's on the table at this point. All right, let's talk about Florida. We got to keep going. Coaching, obviously, Paul Reese, Paul Maurice not going anywhere after the run to the cup finals that the Panthers had. Top two lines. It's a little bit interesting, obviously, with Evan Rodriguez coming into town. So right now I have it, Barkov, Rodriguez, Reinhardt as the top line, and then Bennett, Verhage, Tachuk reprising their line. How does that sit for you, Blake? Yeah, no, I think we're we're in line there. Um, yeah, Rodriguez on the on the top line. That's interesting. So, but yeah, I'm with you with the same top six. Yeah, it will be interesting for Rodriguez. I do have him there for 37 and a half points. He's never been a guy like I have him for an 8.2 percent shooting percentage. I just don't think it's a guy whoever is going to convert enough. He had one season where he did it at a good enough level in Pittsburgh that he was fantasy relevant for like half a season, yeah. and that's pretty much been it for his career. So, he is a guy who will have some stretches here and there just because he 
generates a ton of shots, but he's not a guy I don't think who's going to convert enough to be like a season long hold in most leagues. The power play here again, Barkov, Chuck Reinhardt, Bennett Montour is the way I have it shaping up now. I do think there are some different configurations that are possible. You saw them go with 2D on this power play at times with Ekblad there in Bennett's place mostly. So I do think that's a possibility. Obviously, Ekblad coming back from a whole slew of injuries. I think he broke every bone in his body. Is that right, Blake? Uh, but yeah, I think he's uh, maybe they may ease him back in. So it may be Bennett who gets the first look there and Bennett is who played on the power play mostly in the playoffs as well which I am factoring in here as well does that sound right to you Blake yeah Aaron Ekblad this guy he you know first off yeah he, he's he's injury prone but it's not even he has bad luck like I think one of his injuries last season or the season before he legit fell down the stairs like buddy <laughs> You're not even on the, the rink. Like, oh, my God. So, yeah, it's, you know, his loss, Brandon Montour's game. All right, there you go. Yeah, so let's talk about Montour. The defenseman here, all in general, I talked about this on a previous episode over the summer that I really think that they have three of the best shot-producing defensemen across the league. Obviously, the system there allows them to flex that muscle, but you know, not every defenseman has that muscle to flex. So they have that there in spades in Montour, Ekblad, and Gustav Forsling, who I think is widely underrated. I have Forsling for 43 points, Ekblad for 49, and then I have Montour getting all that power play work up at 6. 69 points, which is pretty nice. nice. You have a similar look here, 46 for Forsling, 48 for Ekblad, and then 70 for Montour. So looks like we're pretty much in alignment. But I really think the thing I want to highlight here, I've talked about Forsling in that previous episode and how I think that he'd have a huge ceiling if he ever did find his way onto the top power play unit. But Montour for me is just for real like I believe everything about the breakout last year took a step in some ways but a lot of the underlings were there for a long time before and he just needed the minutes and needed the big role to really show it off and now it looks like he's got that he's got the trust of the coaching staff I just don't have a reason to discount Brandon Montour at this point no and he looked great in the playoffs like he really looked he just he's on another level right now than um and that's you know, that's the coaching change, right? If Paul Maurice doesn't come in there, does Brandon Montour break out the same way? Like, probably not. You know, he got the confidence of the coach. He's out there playing big minutes. And uh, yeah, I, I don't think, I, I did not predict that he would take power play one away from Ekblad there at the beginning of the season, especially after the season that Florida just had, which was a great offensive season. They were the best offensive team in the league in 2021. So yeah, it's uh, the only caveat with Montour, honestly, going into this season is how's his shoulder holding up? Like, you know, mm -hmm. he, that, he had a shoulder injury that required surgery, right? So he should be ready by the time the season starts. Um, I don't remember if it's training camp or the season, but, you know, that's your shoulders are pretty important. Uh, you know, you, you got <laughs> you need a good shoulder to, to, to play defense and offense there uh, in the league. So um, that's something I'm keeping an eye on. I don't know. But with that, I think there's some opportunity for uh, Gustav Forsling um because uh Ekblad will probably be he's banged up coming into the season too right it, does he start the season so I like Forsling like as a, a a kind of a later pick in your drafts like wherever you can get him at value but he could get the power play one at the start of the season um and I think that's I sort of baked that into some of my numbers here as well for a 46 point season mm -hmm. yeah that's definitely a possibility uh, we'll see as training camp rolls in as we start to get news obviously we'll get that a uh, little bit of news and we'll adjust accordingly but definitely worth keeping an eye on really differences in projections if we're going to talk about this we went through this list trying to find somebody to talk about we had no player more than four points apart which is uh, probably a good sign in terms of the accuracy of these projections uh, we didn't you know talk about the teams at any point until after we had done our projections so for us to be that close just across the board is a pretty good sign i'd say for uh, what you can expect from these players. Uh, I want to talk about Barkov because I think he's wildly underrated just due mm -hmm. to injury. I've talked about, you know, just buying the injury dip on players because I think it's vastly overrated in fantasy hockey. You see the season that Carlson had last year. I was telling people to buy Eric Carlson last year. I had a good projection on him. Obviously nothing like the season that he did have, but I was pretty heavily overweight on Eric Carlson in my projection. Uh, other guys I've been in on in the past, Latang, um, Malkin this past year, I was drafting at his projection, not discounting for injury risk, and he finally had an 82 game season and all of a sudden he's totally worth it 
uh, and all that and then some. So really not buying that Barkov, you know, is just totally injury prone and he'll never stay healthy. Whenever somebody tells me that story, I see opportunity more than I see risk. Barkov you have for a 98 point pace. I have him for 102 points. I yeah, just a player that should be right around that 100-point mark if healthy. And I think you can draft him in a lot of places alongside guys like probably Nugent Hopkins, who we have for 20 points less. Like, There's a significant advantage, I think, to be gained potentially here with Alexander Barkov. Yeah, I love the player. And honestly, I, I was a little bit shocked when I projected him because, yeah, he came out at 98. I was like, Really? I, I was thinking like maybe point per game, just over point per game, Barkov, but 98. And that's, you know, I, that's nothing crazy. I'm not going wild on any of my numbers. Like it's all right in line with some of his career numbers. Um, so he's a great player and he's going crazy late. Like third round Barkov, end of the third round Barkov I'm seeing, sometimes fourth round Barkov. No. All right. I mean, yes, <laughs> you want <laughs> that, right? That's what you want. But you know, it's crazy to me. This guy's going to be a gamer. Like we've talked about this before. Uh, we're, I think we're both in on Florida next season. These guys should have done a lot better. They, they, they were inefficient last year uh, with their conversion. And I think there's going to be some, you know, positive regression for a lot of their players, Barkov being one of them. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm glad you mentioned about the injury narrative too, because I think we're, we're in agreement on that. And I'm glad because it's something that I just, I, I don't like that. You know, when people are like, well, I'm baking in some injury risk. It's like, how are you doing that? Like, are you, you know, do you have an, like, are you x-raying the man before he goes on to the <laughs> thing? Are you like, analyzing his stride? And then, you know, like you're going to miss out on things. So I think we have to judge people on an 82 game basis and expect that they'll play 82 games, you know, caveat to that. Like when you got guys that are injured coming into the season or, you know, like that, that's where I will kind of, you know, be a little bit more careful. Right. I'm not just gonna be like, mm -hmm. Oh, he's not going to get injured. He's fine. Like, no, if you like, like your max patch ready, you know, and you got two yeah. Achilles tears, like, you know, I, I might, I'm definitely baking in some, some problems there with Max Pacioretty, even though I love the player. Right. But to just go like, ah, oh, Malkin's injury, injury prone, Barkov's injury prone. Like, no, you know, then he's going to play 82 games and pop off for a hundred points. So yeah. I, I love that you mentioned that. Yep. Uh, just kind of last notes on the team overall. I do think somehow, despite them going to the cup finals, this team is still like kind of underrated across the board. Like it feels like nobody believes uh, anybody on the Panthers. And so I'm pretty happy to scoop up Panthers this year. You know, I've got Sam Bennett for 62 points, Sam Reinhart for 78 points. You're there at, you know, 65 points on Bennett and 83 on Reinhart. So like, we're pretty much in line uh, across the board, as we mentioned. I think we're both anticipating that this is really going to be a team to target. There's going to be a lot of players that are going to slip. Uh, some who didn't have the greatest regular season last year and kind of came on in the playoffs. Some who did it the other way around. But overall, when you get really down into the numbers and you really get to the root of it, I think this is going to be a team where there's going to be some value to be extracted in drafts. All right. We'll keep rolling and talk about the LA Kings. Again here, no coaching change. Todd McClellan is back. And the top two lines, I think it's going to be Kopitar. I think it's going to be Byfield. I think it's going to be Kempe. And then PLD, the new acquisition with Fiala. And right now I have it as Arthur Kaliev. I know that's probably wishful thinking. I don't have him <laughs> projected for a ton of minutes just because I, I can't. I can't give them the full two uh, second line minutes and just expect that that's going to stick all year long. Uh, but that's the way I have it at the moment. How do we feel about the top two lines? It's just the one thing I will say that pushes me towards this is the fact that the third line kind of seems really set to me here. It's been Dino more Arvidsson, and that's been a really effective line. Uh, so I'm just not really seeing that they'll necessarily change that up just for the sake of putting the name brand players on the quote unquote second line. Like they might even just play the second line less at even strength. Um, it might be like by ice time, the third line, but it has Kevin Fiala on it. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. It could happen here. How do you feel about the Kings and the forward core here? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because um, I'm in agreement with you there. I would love to see Victor Arvidsson on that second line playing with PLD and Fiala, but I mean, that third line, Dano, Arvidsson, and Trevor Moore, they're cooking. And they were cooking all season. And LA does it a little differently. They they really spread out the, the deployment at even strength. They spread out the deployment on the power play. 
So, I mean, everybody's eating in LA. And it was interesting when we were projecting this team because, yeah, I, I was surprised how many minutes everybody's getting, how much, you know, power play, how much uh, penalty killing time. So, I think, yeah, I'd like to see Kelly of there too. I mean, it's Kelly of our Arvidsson, honestly, but I don't see why they would break up that third line when they don't need to. Yep. So top power play, I do think, will be Kopitar, Fiala, Kempe as the mainstays returning from last year, along with Doughty on the back end. And then Pierre-Luc Dubois, like, they went out and got the guy, and they paid him a butt-ton of money. I just think that that points me towards him being the fifth member there. I didn't go all in and give him the full, you know, I've talked about three minutes as kind of the, <laughs> the uh, point of saying that he's going to be on power play one all year long. I give him the two minutes and 45 seconds projection here. So just baking in a little bit that he might not be there all season long. But that is how I'm projecting it currently. How do you see that playing out, Blake? I see it the opposite. Damn it. Um, <laughs> you know, I, it, it's all, it's all good, but I, they do interesting things there in LA. Like they put Fiala on like the second power play. What are you doing? That's Kevin Fiala, buddy. No. Um, so I, I don't know. I'm kind of, predicting that it's going to stay to the form that they had in the playoffs where Arvidsson was the man. Arvidsson still played his third line role, but this guy played almost four minutes on the power play in the playoffs. And I know that's an outlier. That's the playoffs, right? They're, they're getting their horses out there. They're trying to win games, right? But I, I don't know. It, it worked well. This guy had five power play points in six games in the playoffs. And he, he's a, an amazing power play performer. I'm talking Victor Arvidsson right now. He only had two minutes and 15 seconds power play time on ice in the regular season. And that was on power play too. And he had 25 power play points. This guy's a beast. Um, so Victor Arvidsson to me, I, I think it makes sense to have him there and PLD. Let's see what we have. Like I, I could definitely see them switching that up throughout the season because that's what LA does. But I think they like that top unit with Victor Arvidsson there. They know what it looks like, and they have confidence in Victor Arvidsson. So I'd like to see Arvidsson there. I think that's what's going to happen and kind of spread the love there on the second power play because that's no slouch either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so obviously I didn't see it that way. Let's talk about it because this is the biggest difference in our projections. Might be our biggest difference in projections across the entire NHL. You have Arvidsson here for 71 points. I have him for 50. So it's a pretty pretty big spread here. You have him for almost 18 minutes time on ice. I have him for 16 minutes, 45 seconds time on ice. Definitely the power play is a big factor. 10 points difference on the power play between us. You have him for 24, me for 14. So again, it's a little bit of that, a little bit of the shooting percentage. I have them for 10, 9.9%. You have them for 11%. There's a few different things going on here. But I think the thing for me is I don't see them being on the top power play. I do them for two minutes and 15 seconds. So I am baking in a little bit more than, you know, just a run of the mill power play two player. Uh, but I don't think A, that he's going to be on the top power play to start. I think that's. Uh, an area they targeted for better or for worse or uh, if they needed to or not I do think that Dubois when you pay him that kind of money you're kind of throwing him into that role pretty much from the start and then just the fact that he's going to be with Dano and more guys who are not converters not really set up men either of their own right like they generate a ton of chances mm -hmm. but they're not particularly efficient and so that kind of all works together uh, for me to just kind of bring Arvidsson's overall projection down to this point Obviously, from your stance, you're kind of on the top end that he's going to get yeah. that exposure uh, to better players at even strength and on the power play. And that that's all pretty much going to go according to plan. And that's how you get to the 71, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, so you've got him for two minutes and 15 seconds again. That's what he had last season. He got 25 points last season on the power play and you've got him for 14 this year. So do you yeah. see like what where do you see that regression coming? Because the line is still like. I'm looking at in looking at it right now. He played with the no Trevor Moore and Kaliev for most of his time on power play two. And that's how that's kind of where he got the bulk of those 25 points. So where do you see like do you see some kind of regression coming for for Arvidsson in, in some of his metrics? Yeah, I'm trying to pull it up here to see the process that I went through. Uh, basically, there's a little bit of a pullback. He had 
a career high in shots per 60 on the power play last year by a large margin. I don't think the situation changed that much. He was career high in IPP on the power play last year by a large margin. So I have that pulling back a fair bit towards his averages from previously as well. Um, so that's a couple of the points there. And then the on ice shooting percentage last year on the power play was 21.5%, which is just bonkers numbers. Um, that's like McDavid level stuff. So it's big time. Um, uh, in the past, like the two seasons directly before that, he was 9% and 9.5%. So I'm just really pulling back uh, in a big way across those numbers on the power play, mm -hmm. um, regressing a lot closer to his career averages, obviously, than you did. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I did regress that too. I got I had him at 14.2, which is still high on a shooting percentage on the power play. But I, I feel like that plus what he did in the playoffs, like I, I just like him there. I mean... You know, uh, again, I think it's in the range of outcomes, like 50, sure. Um, 71, probably high, probably way high. Um, I also, it's a contract year. I know you love this, Nate, um, <laughs> but Victor Arvidsson is in a contract year and he's coming off a great showing um, in the season and in the playoffs. I think realistically, like regardless if he gets power play one or two, I think he's still good for 20 power play points based on kind of what I've seen from this player. And, you know, he's had injuries in the past. Like he looked good to go last season and i think he's got some chemistry with his line and i don't know i like i like this player i you know 71 okay i'm not going to be drafting arvidsson as a 71 point player um but i don't know he might be down there and it, you know even if he gets on power play too i think there's still value yep definitely we got to talk about the defenseman here there's drew doughty and then it seems like kind of there's no one they went and acquired vladislav gavrikov in the off season i think brant clark the prospect might be ready to come up he's been a very heralded offensive prospect for some time now and i do think that this could be his chance to get second power play behind doughty and kind of apprentice in that role here i had don't think Clark is going to be anything for fantasy, but it is something that I'm going to be watching because he does have that pedigree as a high draft pick, as someone that the uh, scouting community has just been all about for quite some time. So keep your eyes on Brant Clark. If Drew Doughty were to go down and Clark were to get up to the top power play, like he could, it's not out of the realm of possibility that he's just a more efficient power play player than Doughty at this stage in Doughty's career. And as Brant Clark ascends. So definitely interested in Brant Clark, but not really, uh, really just a watch list guy, right? Somebody that you're going to see if he gets an opportunity and then you're going to be a little bit quicker on the trigger finger, hopefully than your league mates. Um, I want to keep going and talk about Kevin Fiala because I'm contractually obligated. He's been a staple of apples and Geno's over the years. Uh, Kevin Fiala, I have him for 86 points in 82 games, 17 and a half average time on ice. Like I'm not projecting him for a ton of ice time. You had him at exactly the same uh, average time on ice and 85 points, so only one point different. Really, I think this is just one of the one of the more elite guys at even strength on the power play, just across the board just dominant IPP numbers. I have him for a 76% even strength IPP. That's like McDavid Crosby level stuff. Um, it's really just about the fact that in LA, I don't think he's ever going to get, you know, I have him for 14 and a half even strength minutes. I have him for full power play time, which is only three minutes really in LA. And that gets him to the 17 and a half. So I just don't really think there's a time on ice ceiling here with Fiala under Todd McClellan where he can really eclipse this. So I think he's a really safe projection for like point per game uh kind of projection but i'm not really giving him much of a chance to really exceed that unless you know any player can have some kind of massive shooting percentage season and just go off from that perspective but in terms of you know the normal paths to having more fantasy points for us uh, i just don't see that for fiala so i'm viewing him as a safe player this year but not one that i'm kind of factoring in some huge ceiling for yeah, I keep feeling like the wheels are going to fall off Fiala, but none of the numbers suggest that. Like, this guy mm -hmm. is elite offensively, so you got to just keep riding it. And eventually, I, I mean, I'd like to see a little more ice time, but the fact is he's getting offensive minutes, right? He, he's he's not killing any penalties, so you're, you're not getting any minutes there. Um, but, you, you know, maybe more power play time, too. Like, get him over that three-minute mark. He was 259 last season. Like, can we get three... 325, 310, 315, something like that. Um, I, I just love this player. And fun fact, 
second half Fiala didn't really uh, happen last year. Um, you know, with the LA Kings, he had, uh, what is that, uh, 23, 25 points in his last 23 games. That's not bad, but he had uh, 47 points in his first 46 games. So there you go. He reversed it. He switched it up on us. So, you know, second half Fiala, maybe not a thing anymore. But uh, I love his fit here with the Kings. And then with PLD in there as his center, I, I like that even more. His floor is even more solid to me. I'm a big fan of Fiala. Hope one day he gets 22 minutes a night and absolutely oh, crushes. That would be go. sweet. Uh, we got to keep rolling here. We got to get to the Minnesota Wild. Again, no coaching change. Dean Evason back behind the bench this year. I am a little bit more excited about the offensive potential here. I think Ryan Hartman will go back to being the top center here. Uh, they played around with some different stuff there. There's some injury stuff there as well. But I do think Ryan Hartman gets back as C1 between Kirill Kaprizov and Matt Zuccarello. And then you have Joel eriksson Matthew Boldy, and probably Marcus Johansson as the second line. How do you see that shaking up, Blake? Exactly that way. Um, I th yeah, I like that a lot. I think that's kind of how they were running it towards the end of the season. Hartman was in the doghouse for a little bit. Then he went back up there. Yeah. Yeah, and I think Hartman is a fine player. I don't think he's, you know, going to set the world on fire. I have him projected for 50 points. You have him for 45. So um, definitely a player that's going to be relevant, definitely stream-worthy, potentially hold-worthy uh, if he gets on a hot streak at some point, uh, but definitely someone who can at least facilitate what Kaprizov is doing. I think in some cases there is just such a lack of talent at center that uh, mm -hmm. it was just dragging everybody else down in the wild in the early going last season. And so I think that Hartman is at least a competent enough player that he doesn't drag down uh, the guys that we're really interested in on this team. So the top power play I do have as Kaprizov, Boldy, Zuccarello, Joel eriksson and then Jared Spurgeon on the back end. Do you see that playing out any differently, Blake? Yeah. Um, uh, Spurgeon makes sense, but I've got Addison as the, as the top there. Um, I think they're going to give him the keys to the power play at the very least, and probably just shelter the hell out of him moving forward. But um, yeah, I, I mean, that's, that's kind of a toss up. I, I think Addison has a, has a better ceiling and, and is more kind of um, that's more the type of player he is, right. That's in his wheelhouse. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see it that way. Obviously, it's not the way I projected it, but obviously that is Addison's like um, calling card as a prospect was that he was going to be this this kind of power play specialist. I'm really not that bullish on Addison after what we saw out of him last year and how he seemed to fall into disfavor with the coach at times. Um, it could happen in the in the upcoming season. I'm just not going to bake that in. I'm going to wait for Addison to prove it to me before I really go out and think about acquiring him at any kind of cost to myself. The defensemen there to talk about are obviously just Addison and Spurgeon. There's not really anybody else that's going to be fantasy relevant that we can project anyway at this point. I have Spurgeon for 45 points. You have him for 41. So despite the difference in the power play time there, just not much difference in Spurgeon's projection. He's kind of just always this guy. He's not particularly yep. efficient on the power play. Not doesn't factor in a huge amount. Obviously, it runs through Kaprizov. Uh, so just... Almost, I wonder if like the top power play defenseman spot on Min Minnesota's power play is just not like a spot that we should even be worrying that much about for fantasy purposes. Unless, like, you know, if it was a, some dominant defenseman came through there, then sure. But if it's just like guys that we're looking at for streams because they're in that spot, I just wonder if we should maybe be thinking about other places to park our fantasy bets for the upcoming year. Yeah, what a weird thought, hey? Like this, this power play is excellent, and we're like the quarterback. Eh, you know, I don't know, right? But like they did have the Klingon last year, John Klingberg, right? I mean, he 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 was in there a little bit, but he's gone. Um, so it's either Spurgeon or Addison. That's that's really it. And I don't know. I I think they're really. I I really I I feel good about Addison on power play one there. I mean, when he was in the lineup, he ha he averaged over three minutes um, time on ice on the power play. So obviously, yeah, he fell out of favor with the coach. He was, you know, last quarter of the season, he was averaging 13 minutes on ice. Buddy, that show ain't no good. We need you on the ice, my man. But, uh, you know, he's a young guy. I think they can give him some sheltered offensive minutes. Spurgeon's a beast. He's going to be out there for, for big minutes for this team. And a uh, good thing about Spurgeon, he's a sneaky uh, source of goals uh, from D. Like he mm -hmm. can get you double digit goals, like regardless of whether he's on power play one, he did it last year, 11, 11 goals. He was only had a 25% power play share. Mm -hmm. So 
I think with Klingberg out, I think they'll probably keep Spurgeon there and and pump a Addison's, uh, get his minutes up, and and we'll probably see a similar season. I, I've got Spurgeon for a little bit more. He got 34 last year. I got him for 41 this year. So, you know, with double-digit goals as well. For sure. Definitely a couple of guys that we'll be watching, at least for streamer situations. Yeah. Difference in projections went with the difference on Matt Zuccarello here. I do have what I would consider a ceiling projection on Zuccarello of 82 points, exactly point per game pace. You have him a little bit down from there at 73. I talked about, you know, Evan Bouchard, a guy that I would draft above his projection just because of the potential for him to go absolutely nuclear. I kind of see the Zuccarello situation in the opposite light where, uh, I think like I don't really have a reason to disbelieve uh, that he's not going to be the player he has been for the last little while, but it is a player who's aging. You could see age-related decline if that starts to hit or if he goes cold. Do they move stuff around? Does Boldy get up on that top line with Kaprizov and Hartman maybe? Do they switch things up that way? And then in my mind, Zuccarello really goes down to um, next to nothing if he's not attached to Kaprizov. But just looking at what has been with Capri between Kaprizov and Zuccarello, this is kind of where I fell that like the most likely outcome that I can foresee is that he's going to be good and he's going to play with Kaprizov all year again. Yeah. You can't really doubt uh, Zuccarello anymore. The zucchini man. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. This is a guy like I, I called him last season. I called for him to be a bust, a big bust, right? Um, you know, because he had a, a great season there in 2020, uh, sorry, what was it? 2021, where he had 79 points in 70 games. That's a 93 point pace. Very nice. Um, this last season, 70 point pace in 78 games. And that to me feels more like what this player is like 2021. He was redlining. Um, but what's interesting about that is he had 28 power play points that season. Uh, and I was like, no, th that can't happen again. He crushed on the power play. And then in 2022, he went and got 29 power play points. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, you know what? The zucchini man, he, you know, he's making a loaf of delicious zucchini bread and giving it to all his friends and family. I, I got him for 27 power play points again next season. I think power play floor is solid with Zuccarello. It's just even strength where I think um, things are going to stay similar or maybe regress uh just minimally so like 70 point pace i've got him for 73 i think that's kind of in the wheelhouse here and then you know the season after that i think you know i'll probably be out on this man but uh yeah you can't doubt this man his floor is solid because of the power play definitely um just looking across this team the one player that is going to be a key for this team in my mind is matt boldy i have him for 80 points 37 goals you have him for 35 goals 79 points I think Boldy really showed at the end of last year when Kaprizov went out that he can be that talent that actually drives the bus and can drive his own line, can do all of those things from the wing. And so I'm pretty bullish on Boldy. I think, honestly, if he got on a line with Kaprizov all year long that we could really see some fireworks and he could even exceed this projection. But just given the chemistry there with Zuccarello and Kaprizov in the past, I don't see that as the most likely outcome. And so 80 points I feel decently good about. But honestly, if if you told me his line mates were going to be anybody really other than Joel Eriksson and Marcus Johansson for the season, I think I would have Boldy even higher. How do you feel about Boldy going into the season, Blake? Yeah, I'm excited. In every draft I'm in, someone takes Boldy, and I'm like, oh, God, I forgot about Matt Boldy. Ah, oh, you should have picked him up. <laughs> um, yeah, he's a target of mine for sure. I love 80 points and agree with everything you're saying. I think there's a ceiling there. Um, that said, the line he's playing on, I like. I'm, I'm low-key into Marcus Johansson. I like that move here. Like, not not for really for fantasy, like, but I like that move for that line. I think that line looked good, and he was a part of that, right? And Joel Erickson Eck, Marcus Johansson, and Boldy, they were crushing towards the end of the season, right? Um, and Erickson Eck, too. What a beast. So this is a it's a great second line. So if he doesn't get up with Kaprasov, like he did spend, I'm just looking right now, he spent like 78 minutes at even strength playing with Kaprasov um, and Zuccarello. So, I mean, and it, it was, you know, to mix reviews, right? But where he really popped off is with Erickson Eck and Marcus Johansson. So I like that as your floor. And then, yeah, find a way to get this man with Kaprasov because what does that look like? Like, you know, they're two very talented players, but they might not kind of complement each other in the way that you need to, right? He might be better on the second line. But obviously that power play is lethal. What did he get? 26 power play points. He's probably going to get more than that next year. What the hell did I have him for? 28, 29. Yeah. Boldy, thank you for your service. <laughs> All right.
let's keep going. We got one more team here, Blake. We've yeah. got to get through. Uh, this is everybody's favorite team to talk about for fantasy. Obviously, the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, Martin St. Louis, once again, no coaching change here. Going to be him again behind the bench. I do think, like, you know, if the season goes terribly, I don't see how they don't fire St. Louis at this point. It's been a few years of the same at this point. And so it just feels like this is probably another point at which they might choose to go a different direction at coach or he could stick out the season and they do it in the off season um but yeah if the season goes as poorly as most pundits have it then i don't know if we can project st louis to be there all year long uh so if that does happen then definitely we'll reevaluate depending on who the new coach could be definitely anytime there's a coaching change you want to reevaluate your priors on players and on the team and think about what might change so just something to keep in the back of your mind as we go through the season here and if that does come to fruition but the top two lines here i think the top line is probably going to be the same as it was for at least a part of last year suzuki caulfield and kirby dock and then the second line, again, it's another one of these situations on some of these uh, lower end teams where you could throw these into a blender and come out with a bunch of different answers. Right now I have it as Alex Newhook, Raphael Harvey Pinard, Josh Anderson, third line being Christian Dvorak, Yuri Slavkovsky, and Brendan Gallagher. Uh, do you have it the same way, Blake? Does it matter? <laughs> yeah, I, I think yeah, I have it the same way and no, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. but I love, uh, the Raphael, Raphael Harvey Pernard. I was excited last year. I mean, excited is maybe not the right word. I was, you know, mildly amused, uh, when he started <laughs> popping off. I mean, the man got a hat trick. So I, I think he, he showed out in his limited time. So I'd love to see him on the second line there with that beauty, Alex Newhook. Oh, that lethal weapon. Yeah. I am not into new hook, but I am somewhat interested in some of the members of the top yeah. power play here. Nick Suzuki. Uh, Cole Caulfield, Kirby Doc, I do expect the full top line to be there. And then Mike Matheson on the back end after he had a great end to the season last year. And then I have it right now as Harvey Pennard being the fourth member. Again, a spot that you could tell me a bunch of different answers. And I'd say, yeah, that probably makes sense too. Um, do you have a current leaning on who might be that fourth forward on the power play here, Blake? Jeez, I don't know. <laughs> it's just not a, an inspiring question, is it? Like, ah, oh, no. God. I mean, I, I like give me RHP. Give me RHP on that top power play. Let's see what the man can do. He clearly is a sniper, and he's a beefer too. I, I'm, you know, when I was yeah. projecting him out, I couldn't believe it. Like, I got him for 138 hits and 95 blocks, and I had to take some blocks away. I'm like, this man's not going to block over 100. No, yeah. but what the hell i mean that, that's he only played like 50 some games yes uh, last year so um yeah he's a beefer he's a he's a nice beefer for sure yeah i'm probably gonna have to knock his blocks down when i run through these for the first time i just kind of go with the numbers and i go into autopilot and i just hit whatever <laughs> it looked like uh, but obviously a really small sample size and he was just throwing his body around out yes, there so. probably just trying to make a mark and he did right to his credit but unlikely to sustain that over the course of a full season um, but yeah, I do have it as Harvey Pinard. I'm still not like super bullish. I have a 35 point yeah. projection on him. Despite that 10 power play points in total, you have him for 40 points with nine power play points. Like this is just not a spot that we're going to get super excited yeah. about. Like even the top guys here, you have Suzuki for 66 points. I have him for 63 points. Uh, we both have Caulfield for 40 plus goals, which is nice, but again, just 64 and 67 total points. So mostly goals and then just <laughs> basically nobody else to finish yeah. plays uh, other than Caulfield. So he doesn't end up with a gaudy point total. And then Kirby Doc, you have for 49, I have for 43 uh, yeah, just really scraping the barrel with these guys. I don't think we're going to be super excited about any of them with the possible exception of Caulfield. Suzuki, a guy who gets there uh, basically on volume, 21 minutes or so uh, on average. And then Caulfield, the one guy that you can really get excited about because he does take a ton of shots and he does convert as well. But again, in a situation where he's not blessed with a ton of talent around him, I really don't think you're going to see his ceiling. I do think this is a player that probably has 50-plus goal potential. Uh, if he was in the right situation, playing a ton of minutes with top-end players, then I definitely think that's a possibility for this player just as an individual talent. But I really can't see a scenario in which that comes to fruition with the team that Montreal has built to this point. 
Yep. No, I would echo all that stuff for sure. Let's talk about the defenseman here. So obviously Matheson, I think, is the only one that we're going to really be tracking for fantasy purposes. Justin Barron got on the second power play unit for a fair bit last year. Caden Gooley, another guy that people have talked about, is potentially getting into some sort of power play role. But I think let's talk about Matheson. You have him for 55 points. I have him for 46. So definitely you're buying a little bit more of what we saw last year, and I'm uh, regressing him a little bit on some of the percentages. Talk to me about Matheson and why you think he could hit 55. Oh yeah. I love it. Uh, first off, I love the shot generation, my man. Thank you very much. Um, he just really showed out in kind of his first go around as the number one defenseman, like hit, you know, uh, in 2021 with Pittsburgh, 43 seconds of power play time on ice in Montreal, three minutes, 11 seconds in his first season, bang. And he only got nine power play points. Like that's a stinky power play. There's no one there. Cole Caulfield was injured. Like who's, who's scoring Raphael Harvey Pernard. Um, you know, but, uh, I just like what, uh, first off, there's something that was said like early on, uh, in the season about Matheson when he started really picking up his game and it was from St. Louis. And he just said like, he is such a big fan of this guy. Like he loves, like he, for, he just came off like a 30 minute game. He played for 30 minutes cause they were decimated. They have no one, but he's like, this man skates unbelievably. Like he just couldn't <laughs> be more complimentary of Mike Matheson. And then I started taking notice of Mike Matheson. Then I started looking into the numbers. And honestly, when I put this, this projection together, it's not that far off from what he was doing. Like I didn't pump him up anywhere else. Like I, I don't feel like, I mean, I did this projection a little while ago. I actually had to go back in because I had him for hire. <laughs> I'm like, no, I don't know. That doesn't make sense. But he was on a 58-point pace last season, right? And I think I had him for 58. I, I went back in and kind of adjusted some of the numbers to 55. But, I mean, it, it's just a player I'm interested in. They don't have anyone else. Caden Gooley, to me, is the guy who's who's going to maybe fight him for power play one. And he's too young. They're not going to, you know, Gooley I like, actually, just as a, a dynasty piece and maybe an interesting waiver pickup if Montreal has a good see a uh, good schedule or whatever. Um, but yeah, Matheson, I've got him for a hundred hits, 123 blocks, bang. And then 16 power play points. I just, he's a horse. He's all they've got back there. And I think they're going to ride him until the wheels fall off. Yeah. I do think they're going to ride him until the wheels fall off. I actually have him for more time on ice than you do. Uh, but yeah, just, knocking knocking him down just a little bit on some of the percentages uh, i think the on ice percentage i have him knocked down a bit i have him a little bit less effective in generating chances for other players i have him a little bit less effective on the ipp number um both at even strength and on the power play so it's it's just a i guess a death by a thousand small cuts in terms of the difference <laughs> in our projections yeah. here it's nothing it's no one thing that really uh sets this projection apart it's just i have them being a little less efficient across the board at both even strength and on the power play um and you have them being a little more so it's really just in the end i guess a little bit more about what you believe out of last year and how much you think he can replicate what he was able to do last year so if you're all aboard what he did last year and you think this is mike matheson now good to go he's going to be this guy for the rest of his career or at least for this season uh then maybe you want to be a little bit more in on that definitely i would say a guy that i do anticipate will score some goals i have him for 16 goals you have him for 15 goals so i actually have him for more goals than you um just a guy who takes a bunch of shots for a defenseman and actually converts on a high percentage. So um, definitely somebody, if you need goals from the back end, Matheson is that guy for sure. We already talked about Caulfield. We already talked about RHP. I think that's all that we had from Montreal. And that means that's all that we have for this episode. Before we get out of here, I am going to say once again, you should be jumping into the Apples and Geos Discord server. Absolutely free. Link is in the show description. Click that. Come in and join us. We're talking about all these projections as they come out. Sometimes in the case of Maritz Sider, we talk about it before it comes out. And I get the last say because I get to talk into the microphone here, but you can definitely come and join the conversation. We all get better from talking to each other and raising different points that maybe we haven't considered before. So, 
come in, join the conversation there. It's also a great way to get into some drafts. We're doing best ball drafts. We've done 12 best ball drafts so far, and we'll be releasing more all the way up till the start of the season. You can get into these. They're $5 leagues. I put them together. We don't take a cut or anything. I just throw them together. Everybody pays five bucks. And so everybody has a little bit of something on the line, bragging rights, plus a little bit of money. Uh, but it's a fun way to get your toes wet for this new season that is almost upon us. And lastly here, if you have made it this far, I would ask that you rate the pod. This is kind of a crucial season as we get the casuals back in and they're looking for fantasy hockey podcasts. If we get more ratings, we can get to the top of those lists. So I do ask that you get into those ratings and reviews if you can. It really does help us out. And I see you guys on Apple Podcasts. You're the majority of the listeners, but the Spotify people are the ones who've been rating us the most. So if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, consider yourselves called out. You guys need need to get in there and give us some ratings all right i will say we have had some really nice reviews on apple podcasts i just want to read a couple of them really quick here because i do really appreciate them and i want to shout out the people who did take their time to rate and review um, this one from Ardenim. Really smart guys, good takes, sometimes hot ones. Best part is they don't take it too seriously. Lots of jokes sprinkled in. Great relevant audio clips to make you LOL. Shout out to you, Blake, for those clips going in the cream of the crop stuff. Another one from Monkey 84 very helpful for my drafts, thanks. And another one from DeCursey, who says, The A&G team of Nate, Blake, Binksy, and Hutch pump out consistent fantasy analysis all year long. Each episode deep dives into advanced metrics in an easy-to-understand package. Some of the best dudes in the biz do appreciate those recent reviews. So, yeah, if you're on Apple Podcasts, consider this uh, your call to go over there. Hit that five stars. Give us a quick review. We will read them when we get them. So do appreciate everyone who's done that so far. And let's keep pumping those up. Do appreciate everyone who listens to these episodes. But that's all we've got for this one. Hopefully it brought you some value. Helped you get a little bit better at fantasy hockey today. All the advanced stats you heard today came from Natural Statric, a terrific free resource. Many thanks to the band there there for supplying the music for the podcast. Be sure to check out their Spotify as well. And that's it, folks. Much love. Thank you.